If there's something humans are particularly good at, it's categorizing things. Themselves, cats, colors, even Hogwarts houses. That's because we're adept at recognizing patterns, not just in how things look, but in how they interact with one another. In magic, we often see recurring themes and patterns in how certain decks play out, and how they interact not just with your opponent, but with the board state as well. We call these archetypes because we see them come up in almost every format again and again, like an old friend, or in some cases, an old nemesis. By labeling these different deck archetypes, we can understand what a deck is trying to do just by hearing the name of it. If I say red deck wins, you know this deck is focused on an aggro strategy, has no control elements, and uses cards like Lightning Bolt and Goblin Guide. It immediately tells you what the deck is trying to do and how it's trying to go about it. In this episode, we'll be exploring the three primary deck archetypes seen in Magic the Gathering. Aggro, Control, and Combo. We'll talk about their strengths, their weaknesses, and how to evaluate cards to build these archetypes in both limited and constructed. This is Talarian Tutor. As I've touched on before, aggro is an archetype with a very direct goal, to kill your opponents as quickly as possible. The idea is that you're able to deal lethal damage either by using low-costed spells or creatures in the early turns of the game. This way, your opponent doesn't even get the chance to play magic in any meaningful way. You are on the beatdown when playing aggro, early and always. Aggro is often seen as a strategy that doesn't need a lot of intelligence or thought, or that it doesn't require a high level of skill. This assumption is often made because aggro is a less interactive archetype. However, aggro decks do require a keen understanding of timing, mana curving, and using proactive cards. It is actually often difficult to win with an aggro deck because you're making trade-offs between speed and strength. Though you're getting your cards out faster, they do tend to be weaker and to stay weak, while your opponent's cards only grow stronger over time. Let's take some current standard decks. Aggro Red-White Humans versus Torrential Gearhulk, for example. If the game ends up going to turns five or six and your opponent plays their Torrential Gearhulk and all you have is a Gustwalker, that is going to be problematic for you. At this point, you're most likely top decking and trying to squeak out a win with your smaller creatures. Many aggro decks tend to play out like this, where you're trying to use your smaller, cheaper creatures to edge by your opponent's larger more powerful board state. So what does aggro look like in limited and constructed? What similarities and differences are there in this archetype when we look at these formats? One of the most important themes that aggro decks have in any format is its reliance on curving out immediately in the early turns of the game. This follows our earlier descriptions of aggro as an archetype that wants to play one drops, two drops, and three drops as soon as possible. And so that means we need to hit our lands on every single one of those turns. Let's start with limited aggro. When we take a look at limited formats like sealed and draft, the composition of your deck will have significantly more creatures than in a constructed deck. This is for a couple of reasons. First of all, Limited has a very improvisational, take-what-you-can-get approach that requires you to do your best with a random pool of cards in a particular set. Most sets only have a small amount of removal or burn spells, like Open Fire or Magma Spray, and there's no guarantee that you'll be able to amass a lot of them to create a more spells-based aggro deck. Creatures also have a tendency to inflict more damage on our opponents than a single burn spell. Say I direct a Searing Spear at my opponent's face. They take three damage. That's all the damage that spell ever deals. Whereas a Grizzly Bear, if allowed to inflict damage 
damage twice can deal four damage, maybe sometimes up to six damage, over the course of a single game. Of course, it might never hit, so that is a risk you'll need to take. You're going to see a lot more high-costed cards in limited aggro, by which I mean four to five drops, cards like Puncturing Blow or Manticore Eternal, and you'll also use a lot more creature combat tricks in limited than in constructed. Constructed aggro, in contrast, has the ability to be more spell heavy, using burn spells and removal to pave the way for stronger, harder hitting creatures. These spells tend to be finishers in limited, whereas they're more like bridges in constructed, progressing your game rather than putting the nail in the coffin. In general, the overall quality of cards in constructed will be stronger, since you have a larger pool to choose from depending on what format at your playing, such as modern or standard. In Constructed, your deck needs to be more streamlined and more consistent, which is why you will see play sets of several cards in those formats. This is to make sure that your draws are as frequent and consistent as possible. Your curve will definitely be closer to the ground, and you will rarely, if ever, play four to five drop spells or creatures. So how do you evaluate whether or not a card belongs in a limited or constructed aggro deck? The first question you should ask yourself in this situation is, how good is this card at killing my opponent? For example, let's take a look at Bomat Courier. Bomat Courier is not a particularly powerful card, but it is very good at attacking and rewards you for attacking with it so you can discard your hand. So it's clearly defined as an aggressive card. Let's look at another example, Hellrider. Hellrider costs two red red and wants you to attack with a lot of creatures. It has haste, it hits for three, and if it goes unopposed, it'll do four damage by itself. Therefore, it's a great aggro card. What that card is not great at is blocking. While it's able to do four points of damage on attacking, three toughness on a four-costed creature is just lackluster. It doesn't have any abilities relevant to blocking, but what it does have are a lot of incentives to help you kill your opponent. On the other side of the spectrum, a card that's very bad at attacking in aggro is a card like Wrath of God. This may make it so that it is impossible for your opponent to win, but it's not going to kill your opponent directly or mess with their life total. It's just a reset button that helps you not die or helps your opponent not die if you happen to have creatures out when you cast it. Wrath of God is not a card that is progressively helping a strategy to proactively try and kill your opponent. Another question you should be asking yourself is, is my card proactive or reactive? A card can be described as proactive if it can stand on its own, if it can do something in a vacuum, so to speak, and if it can actually progress the game plan without the help of another card, no matter what your opponent is doing. So looking at Hellrider again, we can see that this is a very proactive card because even in a vacuum, it's doing something, attacking for four points of damage. It's a card that's going to put your opponent closer to death, whereas a card like Condemn is a reactive card. So even though it costs one mana, it doesn't actually do anything unless your opponent does something first. And even if they do, Condemn doesn't put your opponent's life total closer to zero. In fact, it does the opposite. I'm going to talk in depth about aggro gameplay and strategy in a future episode, but for now, let's move on to control. The control archetype is one that relies on foiling your opponent's plans and making it impossible for them to enact their own strategy while gradually placing the pieces over time for your own victory. So whereas aggro is proactive, control is reactive, waiting for your opponents to make a move and then negating their efforts. What control plans to do with either card quantity or quality is eventually outclass what the opponent is doing. So a control deck is going to play a pile of cards that stop their opponent from killing them, and from there, it'll have a control finisher that will win the game by itself. So what does control look like in limited versus constructed? Let's start with limited. 
Just like with aggro, control in limited tends to be focused more on creatures. You'll try and gum up the battlefield with defenders or creatures with high toughness, which can bridge the gap until you hit your six to seven drops, which will help you win the game. Usually, these high drops are some kind of markedly powerful, possibly hard to interact with card, a popular example being Dynrova Horror. In aggro, this is too high on the curve to ever make it into play, but for control, it's a great pick. Control decks can also play quite a few 2-2 creatures to trade off with another deck's creatures. Creatures may not be removal spells, but if your 2-mana creature kills their 2-mana creature, that's what your kill spell would have done anyway, right? Since removal and counter spells are harder to come by and limited, you'll end up using creatures to emulate the effects of those kinds of non-creature spells. So what about control in Constructed? Control decks in constructed formats have a very different build than in limited, relying and employing more kill spells and counter spells than creatures. This is because the card pool you have access to in a constructed format is just inherently larger than in limited. So you have the option of going to the card store and just buying stronger, more efficient spells like Magma Spray or Abrade or Grasp of Darkness. Whereas if you're sitting at a table drafting, you'll definitely definitely see a final reward and think, ooh, a five drop removal spell. That card is great. You also tend to have a much better curve in Constructed than in Limited, playing spells during your first few turns in order to negate your opponent's strategy. Using one drop and two drop interactive spells like Fatal Push, Abrade, and Disallow, you'll live to play your five drop finishers. You might also play sweepers at the five or six drop slot like Planner Cleansing. But after five, you'll start to see a steep decline in the cards that occupy a higher slot. Control decks tend to have two approaches, and the difference between the two can be described as the difference between lowering a frog into boiling hot water and placing the frog in water and then gradually heating it up. In other words, one style can shock your opponent immediately with a win condition that comes out of nowhere, and the other gradually builds up over time towards your inevitable victory. An example of a sudden win condition in a control deck is the Sphinx's Revelation deck in Standard during Return to Ravnica. In the early to mid game, you would use spells and creatures to fend off the opponent until around turn six or seven, ramping up as necessary to at least nine lands. Then you'd play Sphinx's Revelation for six, a white, and two blue, thus drawing six cards and gaining six life. At that point, your opponent ends up in a very tough situation. You're ahead head in not only life now, but also a significant amount of card advantage. It'll be almost impossible for them to win at this point. An example of a gradual control deck is the Glimmer of Genius Hieroglyphic Illuminations deck in the current standard. It aims to create a synergy between these two pieces, creating an almost never-ending engine that can draw two cards over and over again. The idea is to hit every land drop, then draw cards to find and play the exact spells needed in order to stay alive and react to what your opponent is doing. By stymieing your opponent at every turn, you'll be able to finally build real card advantage that, along with your creatures like Cryptic Serpent and Torrential Gear Hulk, will pave your way to victory. All right, so how do we evaluate whether or not a card belongs in a limited or constructed control deck? The main questions you should be asking yourself so far, how well does this card stop what my opponent wants to do, and how reactive is this card? Taking a look at a card like Essence Scatter, we can see that this card is great at stopping our opponent from casting creatures, which can set them back for at least a turn or two. Cards like this are definitely great spells that we can use earlier in the game to help keep our opponent off balance until we can get our win conditions online. Another question to ask yourself is, how much advantage will this card give me in the late game? Examining creatures like Pearl Lake Ancient gives us a good idea of what a great control finisher looks like. Pearl Lake Ancient is a 6-7 and costs 5 and 2 blue, a whopping 7 mana. Though it's expensive, look at what the benefits it gives you are. 
It cannot be countered, and it cannot die to kill spells thanks to its return to hand ability. It has an enormous toughness level, so your opponent can't burn it out or use conditional removal on it. It is a nightmare to deal with, and most players will concede once they realize they just can't get it off the battlefield. Again, let's take a look at Sphinx's Revelation, which is another great control finisher. Though it's not a creature, the sheer advantage you'll be able to gain by just casting it for nine makes it incredibly difficult for your opponent to catch up to you. By playing reactive cards that are difficult to interact with, control decks are able to leave other deck types in the dust with their impeccable sense of timing, discipline, and inevitability. The last archetype I want to discuss today is Combo. Combo is an archetype that describes strategies that combine cards to create either immediate or near-immediate game-winning effects like infinite mana generation or causing infinite damage. Some players describe Combo as being unfair or not playing magic at all, since it takes advantage of never-intended interactions to create tremendous, insurmountable advantage. There are two types of Combo decks, ones that use only a few cards to win and engine decks that require the entire deck to combo off. I'm going to go into examples of an engine style deck when I discuss combo and constructed, but let's take a look first at combo decks in limited. True combo decks tend to be extraordinarily rare in limited, being something that is stumbled upon and built in incidentally, as opposed to being the primary win condition of the deck. You may be drafting at a table and be able to pick up the pieces of an engine or a two card combo, but that is not something you're, you're probably going to be able to do every Friday Night Magic, not reliably anyway. Engine decks are even more rare in Limited, though I suppose an exception may be Storm strategies in Magic, where you're able to play many non-creature spells that will incrementally give you advantage over the span of the game. Truly broken combo cards are also fairly rare to find in Limited environments, mostly because they tend to be weeded out in design and development of a set. When they do make it in and are put together, they tend to be so broken that it's clear it was an accidental oversight. For example, Felidar Guardian and Sahili Rai. But in general, Combo is not a large archetype within the limited environment, so we'll be spending a bit more time on constructed versions. All right, so what about Constructed Combo? Many combo decks in Constructed are considered unfair, mostly because they don't encourage interaction with the other player at all, and instead focus entirely on getting the combo pieces online. These players will end up goldfishing or drawing for the most optimal opening hand, which can sometimes just win the game outright on turn one, as is the case of Goblin Charbelcher decks. Combo decks in Constructed are able to fully take advantage of either the two to three card combo strategy or the full engine strategy, thanks to their access to a larger card pool. Let's take a look at both of those types. Let's discuss two or three card combo in Constructed. An example of a two card combo that can almost immediately go infinite is Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker and Deceiver Exarch. Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker is a 2 2 with haste that casts for two red, red, and red and has the ability tap, put a token that's a copy of target non legendary creature you control onto the battlefield. That token has haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Deceiver Exarch is a 1 4 creature with flash that casts for two and blue and has the text. When Deceiver Exarch enters the battlefield, choose one. Untap target permanent you control, or tap target permanent an opponent controls. By having both cards on the battlefield, you can use Deceiver Exarch to keep untapping Kiki Jiki, which itself can create infinite copies of Deceiver Exarch that can keep untapping Kiki Jiki. Eventually, you will have an arbitrarily large number of Deceiver Exarch that can attack and kill your opponent. The weakness that a two card combo like this has is that it can be easy to disrupt. For example, using an instant kill spell to eliminate the Deceiver Exarch can stop the Kiki Jiki combo in its tracks, leaving only a 2-2 on the board. 
Thus, many of these decks devote the rest of their resources to protect this combo from almost any other kind of threat that could be thrown in the way of their win condition. Another example is the Devoted Druid Vizier of Remedies combo. Vizier of Remedies is a 2-1 that costs one and white. Its text reads, if one or more negative one, negative one counters would be put on a creature you control, that many negative one, negative one counters minus one are put on it instead. Devoted Druid is a 0-2 that costs green and states tap. Add green to your mana pool. Put a negative one, negative one counter on devoted druid and untap devoted druid. As a result, you can create infinite green mana by tapping and untapping devoted druid using Vizier of Remedy's ability. Again, if your opponent can just kill the devoted druid, then they unravel the combo, putting you all the way back at square one. Now let's discuss an engine style combo using your entire deck as the engine in Constructed. As we just went over, a combo deck that uses a few key pieces can be pretty easy to distinguish and disrupt. What can be more challenging to build or challenging to throw off track is the engine combo deck. These decks act like a kind of Rube Goldberg machine, creating a domino-like effect that leads to winning the game. Now the game is not usually won in these circumstances by killing your opponent outright, but by creating the right conditions to have a ridiculous advantage over them. These decks often have a very odd deck list, with seemingly no obvious connection between one card and another. However, each piece is integral to yielding the needed result and win condition. For example, the modern deck Ironworks Combo has almost no interaction with the opponent and their creatures. It has a couple of creatures that can block for you and several artifacts that might attract hate cards, but otherwise it's going to do its best to make a bunch of mana quickly, enabling you to play Emrakul and try to kill your opponent. The entire deck is devoted to one single goal, getting Emrakul out. While Emrakul doesn't kill your opponent immediately, it does provide a very singular threat that cannot be answered easily. The risk with playing engine decks is that because each part of the engine has one specific purpose, there aren't very many tools you can use to influence what your opponent might be doing to disrupt you. For example, playing a lightning bolt gives you many different options. You can deal damage to a creature, to a player, or to a planeswalker. However, Dark Ritual is only going to be able to do one thing, provide three black mana. That's all it can do. And while that may prove important to your deck's engine, it won't be of much use in keeping your opponent at bay. Another downside with engine decks is their dependence on statistics and the odds of being able to draw the right pieces at the right time. So you may sit down, look at your deck list and think, all right, I have a 60% chance of drawing this card in the first three turns of the game. This is an acceptable risk, but given variance of the game, your payoff cards might very well be sitting at the bottom of your deck, causing you to fizzle out. You need to be prepared to accept losses, not because you've misplayed, but because variance just was not on your side this time around. Now there's many other deck archetypes in Magic the Gathering, including things such as Midrange, which I'll discuss in part two next week. But before we get to that, what about the most important question of all? Which of these archetypes should you play? The answer to this question, of course, depends on the format and also on timing. If you're looking for a good win rate, the best time to play aggro is usually right after a set comes out in standard, because the format is still being in some ways figured out. Being proactive and focusing on just killing your opponent is an effective way of getting those early wins. Now, once a format becomes more defined, it's easier to build a control deck to beat what other people are doing. The format is defined, you know what cards people are playing, and you can better design control to counter it. This is usually at the end before the next set is released, or just before rotation. Combo is sprinkled throughout the lifespan of a format sometimes, when and if there is a good busted combo in a control deck. If people are playing a lot of aggro decks, then it's a good time to do one of those engine decks. But honestly, there's only one real answer to this question. Which of these archetypes should you be playing? Any of them you want! 
What is amazing about Magic the Gathering as a game is its flexibility. You can express yourself through gameplay in almost any way you might wish. I love my modern merfolk deck, and no matter how it's doing in the meta, I'll continue to play it, regardless of what other people think. For you, that might be your Cat Tribal Standard deck, your Burn deck, or even 8-rack. Whatever you choose, follow your bliss and fine-tune it to the best of your ability. Different people play magic differently, and in that lies the inherent beauty and freedom of this game. Thanks again for attending another tutoring session here at Tolarian Community College. Today we covered the three main deck archetypes in Magic the Gathering, aggro, control, and combo. We explored what these archetypes look like in both limited and constructed formats, and how to evaluate cards for each archetype. We also went over what subtypes for these archetypes look like and how they operate. Next time, we'll be covering additional archetypes such as mid-range and tempo. This is Tolarian Community College. I'm the professor. Our professional consultant is my own tutor, Emma Handy. Michelle Rapp is our script supervisor. And remember, it's not about winning individual games of magic. It's about getting better, win or lose. I hope very much you found this episode of Tolarian Tutor to be of some use to you. This is a series I wanted to develop for a long time, but I couldn't do it alone. I needed the help of people like my professional consultant, Emma Handy, and my script supervisor, Michelle Rapp. Together, we have put together a series that I could not have done alone, and we could not have done it alone either, not only without each other, but without all of you, the community, showing your support. If you are able to support Tolarian Community College, Tolarian Tutor, or any of the videos that I put forward on this channel, then you can do so over at patreon.com where donations as low as a dollar a month keep this channel keep this series keep all of us going and growing strong so thank you